My topic this afternoon is, is there such a thing as a skyscraper curse? Probably one of the most unusual topics at Mises University, certainly just by looking at the titles of the talks, they're sort of more standard ones, like I did the one on the minimum wage. Is there a skyscraper curse? Well, there better be, because I just published a book on it. <laughs> and if there's not, I'll see y'all later, have a good life. I'm going to have to retire to a foreign country. Got my myself extended with a printed book. Okay. Well, the skyscraper curse is defined as when a world record-setting high skyscraper sets a record, the curse is the economic crisis that follows. And the skyscraper curse comes to us from what's referred to as the skyscraper index. So if you go to Wikipedia, they have an entry on the skyscraper index, not the skyscraper curse, because the curse is really just the culmination of what's going on uh, during the building of a record high skyscraper. This first came to light when Andrew Lawrence published a report in 1999. He's a, a real estate analyst for major investment houses. And when this came out, it actually made the financial press. So it was in Investor's Business Daily, the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, East Asian Review, um, and many other publications discussed it. And they usually tossed it off to the side as a story of the day, kind of cute thing, uh, but they didn't take it very seriously. The skyscraper index is focused only on record-setting tall buildings. And specifically, I've narrowed it down so that the height of the building is measured by the top height of livable space. So if you put an antenna or a tower or some kind of architectural feature, that doesn't count. So livable space is what really matters. Putting an antenna or something on top of a building doesn't represent an engineering challenge. But building livable space 1,500 feet in the sky does cause engineering architectural challenges that have to be met in order to build that livable space. So, for example, to build... Uh, a new record high skyscraper, you might need new concrete pumping technology to get the concrete up that high uh, in the air in an efficient manner. Uh, or you might need some kind of new elevator. Or in the case of the current record building, a new uh, elevator cable. The record setters are begun during a long boom in the economy. And the curse is that record setters are typically completed and open during economic crises. So the general timeline here is that there's a long boom in the economy. The record setting skyscrapers are started. They achieve a record height. And then the economic collapse or crises begins. And then, of course, the building is only finished or completed and open to the public and tenants much later. And as a result, they often open during economic crises. So it's not overall construction or investment statistics that we want to look at here. We're looking at unique events that don't happen very often so that we might have, say, if you saw Patrick Newman's presentation, we might have, you know, uh, 20 some odd recessions 
uh, in the 20th century, we might only have a handful of economic crises. And so we'll look at that history. The first one that uh, Lawrence recorded was the Panic of 1907. The Singer Building, Sony Machines, Metropolitan Life Building were both begun prior to the Panic of 1907. They reached record heights around the time of the panic, and they opened in the aftermath or crises. The Woolworth Building set a new record in 1913. 40 Wall Street, which I think is now the Trump Building, the Chrysler Building, and the Empire State Building opened in late 1929, 1930, and early 1931. And that was followed, of course, by the collapse of the stock market and the Great Depression, which lasted more than a decade. So three, you notice the, these things tend to, will tend to come in groups. And then the World Trade Towers and the Sears Building were completed in 1973 and 1974. The economic crises known as the stagflation of the 1970s uh, began while these buildings were under construction. Some of them hadn't set records yet, um, but all three were under, uh, under construction. The stagflation of the 1970s, fortunately you didn't have to live through that. I did. It was a, a, dec a nasty decade of the Vietnam War, America's <coughs> first losing war, uh, inflation, unemployment is where the word stagflation comes from. We had the oil crisis right about the time these buildings set records. Um, so it was really a nasty decade. The, the stock market lost more than half of its value. And we had what, what amounts to an economic depression in the early 1980s when interest rates and unemployment exceeded 10%. One of the few times it's done that outside of the Great Depression. And then we have a, a curious situation here. In 1997, the Petronas Tower set a new record and there was an Asian financial crisis. Taipei 101 sets another record around 2002 uh, that coincides with the dot-com bubble or the tech stock bubble. But in more recent times, I've come to realize that this was one group of crises. Uh, in my reading of the history of this period, what was happening was in the late 1990s, uh, with Japan down, uh, the East Asian countries were having a boom. And the boom was related tech to, to technology. And then with the Asian financial crisis, the technology meltdown in Asia started and the rise of the tech bubble in the United States began. And so there was a transfer, really, of the tech bubble from Asia to the United States. And then uh, in 2007, uh, the housing bubble came to an end and the financial crisis began and that was related to the Burj Khalafi Tower uh, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, specifically in the Emirate of Dubai. The tower was originally uh, the Burj Dubai Tower, but the leader of Dubai ran out of money during this crisis. He had to borrow the money from his cousin, and so they renamed the building after the cousin. And right now, there's the Kingdom Tower under construction in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's projected to be a tower that's one kilometer tall, which is amazing, but it's only going to exceed the livable space of the Burj Khalafi Tower by about eight floors. So it's going to have one of these spires on the top of it. Okay, so when I saw that skyscraper index in 1999... <clears throat> I realized that while the financial press was dismissing it, that it was really intimately related to the Austrian business cycle theory. And so I began research. Um, after a couple of years, I published a paper called Skyscrapers and Business Cycles in 2005. 
I submitted the paper to uh, a bunch of mainstream journals, and they didn't know what to make of it, and they rejected it because it, it didn't have a testable hypothesis. Didn't have a testable hypothesis. I love that. Um, and usually the, the editor would write back almost like just one line, rejecting the paper. And finally, it was published in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics in 2005. And what we're going to do is look at the Austrian theory that connects the skyscrapers with business cycles. And basically here what we have is the ABCT theory being applied uh, where artificial interest rates, artificially low interest rates over an extended period of time can cause what are referred to as Cantillon effects, which are structural changes in the economy induced by artificially distorted interest rates. The first Cantillon effect, which is named after Richard Cantillon, who I also have a book that you can buy, really inexpensive too. <laughs> um, interest rates lead to increases in land prices. Every real estate person knows this. Every big land owner knows this. Uh, but the general public is largely unaware because the general public typically doesn't buy land during their lifetime. They only buy land when it has a house on it, and they're not even really thinking about the cost of the land. Uh, and very few people engage in buying large amounts of land and selling large amounts of, amounts of land. But basically, the effect here is you have interest rates and land prices and if interest rates go down, land prices go up. If interest rates go high, land prices will go down. And you can always tell when interest rates are artificially low. And this is, this is something that the theory doesn't tell us. But I can sense that interest rates are low simply on the basis of how many signs go up along highways and so forth that says land for sale. Because the landowners realizing that land prices are land is in demand and prices are up. So interest rates, low interest rates lead to higher land prices. That's the first effect. The second effect is that lower interest rates increase the size of companies. This is also something that the general public is largely unaware of, but economists have actually studied this uh, and other in uh, other disciplines as well. And they've come to realize that there's a pattern here that when interest rates are low or, in our world, artificially low, it leads to increases in the size of companies. Yes, sir? What's the, uh, how does that work? Do they buy out their competitors or do they be available credit? Or? That's one of the mechanisms. Uh, it could be as simple as an industry evolving from mom and pop firms to franchise corporations. But with respect to your point, which is a very good one, economists have also found that mergers and acquisitions, when two companies merge together to form a larger company, or acquisitions where one company buys another and integrates it into themselves. So Exxon buys mobile, and they become one company. There's a pattern to these, uh, to mergers and acquisitions uh, right now, of course, they're, it's very high, um, and at other points in time, it's very low or non-existent, um, and that pattern matches up quite well with changes in interest rates. So lower interest rates allows companies to merge and to acquire, and it also allows for this mom and pop to franchise corporations for that process to be sped up. And when you go from mom and pops to franchise corporations, you're, change, you're not changing the product very much. What you're doing is you're changing the way the company works. Okay, so with mom and pops, you know how that goes, basically. Mom does X, Y, and Z, and pop does A, B, and C. Um, and their kids take out the garbage or whatever. Um, so 
what's the difference between the firms? Well, they're bigger. The, the, the new firms are going to be bigger, but also they have to have research and development offices. They have to have human resource offices. They have to have accounting offices. They have a strategy and marketing department. And so these larger corporations, instead of being spread out all over the economy and independent, now it's all under one roof and they become the modern corporation with all of these different uh, centers. And so they need much more office space. Okay, so a mom and pop have an office space, the equivalent of a, of a large closet. Uh, big corporations need huge amounts of space, typically in central business districts. And outside of the Kingdom Tower, most of these record-breaking skyscrapers are in major metropolitan central districts. Most of them have occurred in New York City uh, or Chicago. And then, of course, there's not record-breaking skyscrapers, but there's skyscrapers all over the major cities of China. Someone sent me a, a list of 20 cities, I think, in China that are larger than New York City, but you know, you've never heard of them before, and you certainly can't pronounce the name. Okay, and the third and final one is that record-breaking projects create new construction technologies and building systems. Um, and this is where this last one shows how these higher buildings influence the entire economy. So new construction technologies are things like the size and capacity of the cranes, the size and capacity of the cement pumping technology, um, all sorts of things that are uh, about uh, the construction. So these tall cranes uh, in Auburn. I've been here for 36 years, never saw one before until two years ago. In Auburn, I mean. Building systems, uh, this is like heating and air conditioning. Um, it's like elevators, escalators, uh, water and sewage. Uh, every building has literally dozens of systems, including, you know, fire alarms, you know, just everything that goes into building this building um, goes into building record high buildings. <coughs> but because the height is so high, you have to adapt. You have to create new technologies. You, you have to make elevators go faster. <coughs> if you, I estimated that if you uh, used our elevator here at the Institute in the Burj Khalafi Tower, um, even if you'd never stopped on any of the floors, it would take almost 15 minutes to get to the top. <laughs> and, you know, so you're, the higher you go, the more people you have to move up and down. And you can't just add more elevators. The reason you can't just have more elevators, more air conditioning duct work is because every square foot of system is a square foot on, say, 140 stores, stories, you realize that that's costing you way too much. And so they have to invent brand new things, brand new technologies, brand new factories and delivery systems. So this is where uh, we show that the record breakers uh, are causing changes in technology, changes in the structure of production in the economy. And so this is an illustration of what's going on throughout the economy, even in Auburn, Alabama. So the record-breaking skyscrapers, skyscraper index and curse are an illustration of what's going on in the economy more broadly. Uh, then we had the housing bubble, the most recent bubble crisis. And because I was working on this topic, I was also more keenly aware of what was going on in the American economy at that moment. So remember, the article on skyscrapers and business cycles came out eventually in 2005. So I just happened to be working on this subject and paying keen attention to it. So that um, in June of 2004, 
I published an article on Mises Daily called Housing, Too Good to Be True, where I basically explained not what only was happening and why it was happening, but what would eventually happen uh, a couple of years later in the economy. And most of, uh, well, not most of my friends, um, a few of my friends thought I was crazy. Maybe a couple of them are here this week. <laughs> or were, were here. That's another hit. And then um, a little bit later, uh, actually, my first article on the housing bubble was in February of 2004 on lourockwell.com. And then in August of 2005, I wrote an article, is, is the housing bubble popping? And I showed uh, stock market data and using technical analysis, I identified that the, stock, the stocks of home construction companies had popped significantly enough to indicate that it was likely a topping of the housing market and the, ho the housing bubble. This wasn't clear to anybody else uh, at the time. In fact, like Peter Schiff, I think, didn't mention any of this until 2006. Uh, the Economics of ho the Housing Bubble I published in June of 2006. I was asked to write a paper for a chapter in a book on housing construction in the United States. Mine was the only chapter that really had to do with the macroeconomics of it. Everybody else was talking about zoning and land use planning and all that. And um, because of the popping of the housing bubble, this book project uh, sputtered and they lost the publisher. Um, and when they got a new publisher, the editor asked me to take out some of the more gory details in my article, which I was willing to do, um, because I wasn't sure if I was right. Absolutely sure. <laughs> yeah. We told you so, so, which is sort of a compilation of some of these things on lourockwell.com. And then uh, August 7th, 2007, I made a blog post, of all things, uh, and it was titled, New Record Skyscraper in Depression in the Making about Dubai and the Burj Khalafi Tower. And of course, this wasn't really evident to anybody at the time. And so I was giving public lectures here in Auburn and elsewhere, and one that came out in, um, I think it was June of 2007 that I did, it was for Auburn University students at the university. And um, it turns out all these bankers and construction people showed up. And they weren't very happy at all at what I was saying. And I was a little concerned, too, because I was like in the back of the room and the doors were on, <laughs> on the other end. And the place was packed. So I felt trapped. Um, <laughs> And, you know, other things, uh, one interesting paper that I did much later, it was called Transparency or Deception, What the Fed Was Saying in 2007. And uh, very interesting, I think, basically I went back into the speeches of major figures in the Federal Reserve and quoted them as to what they thought was going on in the economy in 2007. And they thought it was all great that they had mastered the business cycle, that they um, were right there. They denied bubbles ever existed. Um, one fellow, Randy Krosner, who was uh, vice chairman of the Fed, I think, at, at one point, is at the University of Chicago, and his uh, speech was about how all these collateralized debt instruments uh, were such a great thing. <laughs> that they increased transparency, that they increased liquidity, you know, and that turned out to be so 100% wrong. Nobody had any idea what was inside those financial instruments. So transparency, that's ridiculous. And liquidity, well, we saw what happened to the liquidity of those things. As soon as the uh, something hit the fan, they were completely illiquid, completely. 
So on 2010, January 8th, when the Burj Khalafi Tower opened, CNN had this uh, report about what was going on on the ground in Dubai. And thankfully, they actually mentioned me and in my blog post, they got my name spelled correctly. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times, and, and I don't really care too much, but a lot of times people will use my work and not cite me at all. And I'll come back to that issue uh, a little later in my talk. <laughs> Several times, actually. <laughs> uh, but noteworthy is that the there is a literature that has developed and is developing on this topic. Greg Kaza in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics looked at the skyscraper index in the, his home state of Michigan and his adopted state in Arkansas, uh, verifying the skyscraper index. Gunter Loeffler, uh, a prominent financial economist, uh, working on that. But notice he's saying it's overvaluation and confidence that's causing this. Uh, and this is where the confusion enters this literature. Uh, Jason Barr, who's very prominent in this literature, he's a real estate economist from uh, Rutgers University. That's Jason Barr again. Real factors and builder competition or ego. Uh, so they're, they're trying to embed irrational variables in their models. And again, he comes down here with real and psychological variables. Uh, and here the height competition. He changes the word from paper to paper, but it's basically the same paper. Um, height competition only occurs at peaks. And height by height competition, what he's referring to is if somebody builds a 120-story building, the next person's going to do 125, and then 130, and then 135. Uh, and that's, that's irrational. And he says that only occurs at peaks. Interesting that you can only be irrational at certain phases of the business cycle. And then he and two other Rutgers economists came in with skyscraper height and business cycle, separating myth from reality. Guess who's responsible for the myth? <laughs> Yours truly. And the reality is represented by Jason Barr. Uh, they looked at announcement dates and opening dates and whether or not they were correlated with GDP, and they find the answer is no. Well, the announcement date can come very early, like the, the uh, trade towers in New York City were announced in 1960, five years before they began construction. They weren't finished for 12 or 13 years later. Opening dates are when they're open to the public and tenants, uh, which is too late. So they're too early and too late, and there's no scientific way of dating these things perfectly. They also use data from the U.S., Canada, China, and Hong Kong versus real GDP, and they did a Granger causality test, which shows that GDP causes height. So the bigger the GDP, the bigger the buildings. And their co-integration tests show that GDP and height are co-integrated and share a common pattern. Not that they're cause and effect, but they simply share a common pattern. So if a person, the lady, is walking her dog on a leash, you know, the dog may be in front of her, on the side of her, behind her, ahead of her, and that may change several times along their walk, but they're basically following the same path. And they conclude, therefore, height does not predict cycles. They move together with temporary deviations due to builder competition. Again, the irrational builder competition near the peaks. So basically they dismiss my work because height, the skyscraper going up, uh, does not predict the skyscraper curse. Lucas Engelhardt in a 2005 working paper, Why Skyscrapers, a Spatial Economic Approach, shows that lower interest rates increase land prices and wages, uh, higher opportunity cost of commuting leads to taller buildings, uh, supporting my original paper to a certain extent and actually extending the analysis uh, more along 
economic lines than along uh, strictly real estate economics. So what can we say about this paper? Well, there seems to be some general agreement that we need to test uh, the relationship between lower interest rates and economic expansion, higher stock prices, and skyscraper construction. Some of the authors use different data sets uh, to do this, but there's still a general notion behind the skyscraper. Whether or not it's real or whether or not it's uh, irrational, uh, they haven't decided. Um, and let's see. Again, you have the builder competition status, social status, and ego, but only near the peaks in the business cycle amongst the bar type, uh, Jason Barr type analysis. The important point that from Austrian business cycle theory is that Austrians do not deny deviations or changes in psychology, even at the social level. Okay, we don't deny the fact that during a boom, people become exuberant. And we don't deny the fact that when you have a crisis, people become depressed and less interested in entrepreneurship and investment and things of that nature. We don't deny that. We, it's part of our theory, really. We don't talk about it much, um, but actually I do in this book, which is only $18 for students, by the way. <laughs> okay, so the latest paper by Barr et al., which is where he tries to you know, undermine the skyscraper curse theory with his various, with their various statistical testing. And, and by the way, the one exception, did you remember the exception that I, on the history of the curse in the index? What was the Woolworth building? And the original formulator of this, Andrew Lawrence said, that was a mistake of the skyscraper index because there was no economic crisis after the Woolworth building set the record. But in fact, if you went back and looked at the actual data, you'll see that after that building set a new record, the American economy went, did go into a crash. But within several months, we were saved from a big crash, big lengthy crash, by World War I. So when World War I started, Europe simply could not get enough of our grain products, our steel products, our munitions, all sorts of things Europe was importing from the United States, and it put the U.S. back into an expansion. So it's not really a mistake of the index. It really, when you put it into historical context, uh, it's, it's a correct uh, signal, and uh, I would argue that the war really is responsible for us not having a label placed on that. In the absence of World War I, we would have had a long, lengthy uh, correction in the economy, and it probably would have been referred to in history as the post-World I depression or, or something along those lines. Okay, so our response was that there's no particular date that should be used to time the skyscraper curse. Uh, and you certainly should not use announcing dates and opening dates. Uh, we prefer to use when the project gets off the ground. Okay, so when somebody starts a new project that's gonna break a record, that's when I issue a skyscraper alert. And when the skyscraper itself reaches new record height, that's when I issue a skyscraper signal that there is an imminent danger of an economic crisis right before our eyes. So the fact that they couldn't match up the wrong dates doesn't really have any negative impact on our analysis. And we also agree that record-setting skyscrapers do not cause economic crises, which is exactly what they're statistical analysis says. They, they said that height does not determine GDP. And we've never said ever that just the building of a, a building somewhere in the world is going to cause a world economic crisis. <laughs> so they either didn't read the paper at all, 
or they have like a fifth grade education. <laughs> and believe me, five years of math and stat can do that to you. <laughs> so remember back to the Granger causality test where the dog and the lady are walking along on, a, on a, the same path, essentially. That's what the skyscraper index argues, is that artificially low interest rates cause a record-setting skyscraper and an economic crisis. So that's exactly, their findings are exactly backing up the theory. And yet, the journal that they published this in, we asked for an opportunity to offer a correction. They denied it. We offered them a comment, several pages of explanation of this. They rejected that. And not only that, but their article got picked up by the editors of The Economist magazine, and they published an edit unsigned editorial March 28th. If the skyscraper curse suggests the decision to build the biggest towers happened near the peak of a business cycle, then you could use record-breaking projects to predict the future path of GDP. However, the range of months between the announcement of the towers and the business cycle peak is large, varying from zero to 45 months. And only seven of the 14 open during the downward phase in the business cycle. In other words, you cannot accurately forecast a recession or financial panic by looking either at the announcement or the completion of the world's tallest building. And of course, they didn't mention me in the article. They mentioned the article in the references to skyscrapers and business cycles, they got the wrong year. I sent them a letter explaining all this and asked them to change the year of the reference and add my name. And I got an email back 90 days later that said my letter had been misplaced. And they didn't print the letter either. And despite what you just saw from The Economist, this is the graphic that they used. So you've got the panic of 1907 and the buildings opening up here at Singer Building. Uh, you've got the three buildings in New York City and the Depression. But actually, of course, the, the fact that you had three led the Depression out until the early 1940s, and then trade tent, uh, tower centers in the Willis, which was the Sears building. Um, then they put the oil shock in there, but actually the economy was hurting from 1970 uh, to 1982. And then the Asian financial crisis and the financial crisis and housing bubble. Um, and so the building is situated where it's being completed. So it's sitting right over here, 2010. I don't know how you could put that graphic together and the editorial and put them in the same issue. So the skyscraper curse it, uh, illustrates what the Fed is doing to the economy. Those technological changes, the changes in the structure of production are happening throughout the economy. It's just more visible uh, and better illustrated by these record-setting skyscrapers. The index has a good record of prediction. We went back into the 19th century, found several other record-setting buildings. Mainstreamers resort to psychological factors but fail to explain them. Where do these psychological changes, why do they occur? I've always found that puzzling that economists would refer to psychological things causing it rather than some economic cause. And um, the Kingdom Tower has also been renamed the Jetta Tower. And it was on schedule to set the record late this year. And then they threw the builder of the building and one of the big financial backers in the building into custody related to 
the corruption scandal in Saudi Arabia. And so th that building has been on hold since November of 2017. So I expect the skyscraper index to be incorrect here because either that building is never going to be completed or it's going to take um, several more years uh, to complete the project. And I don't think the economy, um, I think the economy is set up more to coincide with the anticipated record setting date rather than the actual record setting date. Okay. So thank you very much.